Um, so quick intro to myself, uh, like David said, my name's Humayun, I'm the product manager leading a lot of the machine learning initiatives within property imagery and recommendations across Expedia Group. So before um, we deep dive in, into the machine learning and data science techniques that we use to optimize our imagery within Expedia, let me give you a quick introduction to property imagery and why it's important to our customers within Expedia. So at Expedia, uh, Expedia Group, we have over 75 million different property imageries across our sites. And this continues to grow as we onboard more and more hotels and properties. From the images that you see here on this slide, you can see that we have various different touch points that our customers interact with imagery. Um, often uh, our customers or people who are looking to book hotels or properties will often see the first hero image, imagery on the search results page or the home page. And this is what we often refer to as the hero imagery, which will be the focus of the presentation today. And then when customers progress, you start to see more imagery around that property, more detailed imagery around the amenities, the rooms, uh, the accessibility features to really help our customers make an informed choice about that property. Uh, if you go to the next slide, sorry. Um, oh, actually, sorry, Federal, previous slide. Uh, so really quickly, before we go into the details of the journey that we took, we know that imagery is really important to our customers. Uh, we know that, for example, when we do our research within Expedia, it ranks consistently three, uh, top three after price and location. Um, and today, Federal and I and Dudia will talk a bit more around how we are adding more relevancy factors into showing the more appropriate imagery for our customers. So go to the next slide. Um, before we deep dive into that, I just want to give a quick overview uh, into our journey that within Expedia Group and EPAM have taken to really accelerate machine learning within our, within our image space. So back in 2017, our focus has really been on investing in the kind of machine learning technologies and the data tools to really understand the, uh, the type of imagery that we have. We invested quite a lot in the computer vision space to help understand the image and the context. And we actually applied that to really understand to remove the near duplication of our imagery. So when hotel or partners are uploading very similar imagery, it probably doesn't make sense to our customers to show very similar imagery. And we also created a clear taxonomy, uh, which ultimately helped us to moderate the imagery that we actually show to our customers to make sure that we're not showing um, explicit or any type of inappropriate content to our uh, customers. It was in 2018 and 2019 where we really accelerated our efforts within Expedia Group to add the product adoption of these machine learning techniques to really optimize the imagery and make them much more relevant to our customers. So we invested our engineering and data science effort infrastructure to test image algorithms, image algorithms that have been tested in a hero image space. So the first hero image that you see on the search results page, the property de details page, the booking form to even the emails that you see. We want to show our customers the best image of that property. So we tested the algorithms in that space. We also tested the algorithms in our image gallery space. So how can we show the best order of imagery to really represent that property within the property details page? But it was back in the, in, in the latter half of 2019 and 2020 that we took a renewed approach. And this is where we're going to focus the presentation today, which is looking at understanding how we're adding real-time feedback to really understand from our customers what is the best image that we show to our customers. And this is where we're using multi-arm banded techniques, uh, which Federal and Julia will go into a bit more detail uh, over the course of this presentation. Thank you very much, Humayun, for your introduction. So um, as far as I'm concerned, my name is uh, Fedor. I am a lead machine learning scientist at Expedia, and I've been working on the reinforcement learning space for about three years there. And this is one of the projects that we started working on in 2018, as Humayun said. So I will go through mostly the use case and the basic theory behind multi-arm bandits. So let's start by describing what was the use case, right? So you can see here um, classic um, search page that you might see on any type of e-commerce. Uh, as far as we are concerned, we are selling hotels, right? So you can see here a list of different hotels. And what we want to do is we want to optimize the image, right? We want to find the best possible image to show to our customers on the search page. We call it also hero image. So say that we have those possible candidates, right? The question is, how can we find the best possible image. And I'm being um, kind of vague on purpose, right? Because this is not kind of a um, evident uh, question, right? To answer to. So the question is how, how can we define best, right? Historically, we 
most of e-commerce is, is used kind of rules, right? So on the one hand, you could either apply a rule like you should be showing the bedroom, right? Because the bedroom is the most important feature of a property or a hotel. So this is what you should be showing to your customers, right? Another, which is quite commonly used and was used by us before is just let the hotelier decide, let the property owner decide what is the best possible image, right? They know their property, they know how they want to market it. And finally, also like there are different business rules that we want to apply. So for instance, we don't want to put the toilet as a, as a hero image, right? So we want to potentially have a, a block list to avoid those different images, right? But you can imagine that those business rules cannot really scale well. On the one hand, if you were to impose certain specific rules, right, for specific properties, like in, in, the, first, in the first cell there, it won't really scale very well, right? Because each property is quite unique. Each image is quite unique as well. So you can't really use those rules to choose an image, right? You might actually make a lot of mistakes. Also, deciding, letting, letting the hotel you decide is a, quite a reasonable rule as well. However, the hoteliers do not have the same information that we have about the customers, right? They are only marketing um, property for their customers, but do not really observe or track what our customers are doing, right? So the second way that we approach historically is to use what we call explicit ratings. So the way that we've done it is by using uh, crowd workers, also known as mechanical Turks, to uh, label pairs of images. So we were trying to figure out which image looks better, which image has a better static value. This has helped us to train our computer vision algorithm back in 2017 and tested back in 2018. And uh, that uh, allowed us to already have some, some wins, but you can see there's some problems with this as well. On the one hand, uh, crowd workers might not be representative of our customers. And on the other hand, when crowd workers were asked to decide which image is better, it was in the context of their work. They had to basically um, evaluate the aesthetic value of an image, but, not, but it wasn't really done in the context of them buying a property. So this is why we wanted to focus on the closest we can get to our custom preferences is by using implicit feedback from our customers, right? So as you know, e-commerce have a lot of tracking that observe how the user is interacting with the website. And what we wanted to focus on is whether a property is attracting a lot, whether an image, sorry, attracts a lot of different clicks, right? So we can actually see when an image is impressed on the search page and when a user actually progresses to this property. So this is what we're gonna be focusing on. So how does it, what the project is then about? So what we wanted to use is to use a bandit algorithm, which I will explain later how it works. So in grand scheme of things, the project was first selecting a set of candidates for each property, then run a bandit algorithm separately for each property with this hero candidate up until a point that the bandit will select the best possible image. And in this case, the best possible image is the one that has the highest progression rate. Technically how it works, like most of reinforcement learning algorithms, you have an interaction between the web application, which is the search page and the bandit algorithm. And what happens is that when a customer arrives on the web page, the uh, web app is gonna request an image for this property from the bandit algorithm, which will then return a bandit uh, image ID. And we will then track whether the customer will interact with this uh, property or not. As we observe this feedback, we can then start training the algorithm and refocusing progressively the traffic towards um, images that are showing better performance. So one of the key aspects that we want to cover first is we need to pre-select candidates in such algorithms, right? Some properties have up to 200 images and we cannot have enough traffic to be able to optimize. So we do first some pre-selection. Lucky us, we actually have already a computer vision algorithm that does this aesthetic ordering. What we do is for each property, we select two to seven different candidate images. And we also enforce diversity because sometimes you can have a property that have a beautiful pool and beautiful images of the pool, but obviously we want some diversity 
and show also a bedroom, a terrace, the restaurant, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But how does the Bandit algorithm actually work? So I think if there's one thing to kind of learn about about uh, Bandit algorithm is it's about balancing exploration and exploitation, right? At the beginning of the test, when you start optimizing, the bending doesn't assume which image works the best. So each customer will be assigned a random image for each property. And as we start observing which Im image generates progression to the property, the bandit start progressively converging up to a point that it start exploiting the best possible image, right? So the name of the game basically is to balance the two. On the one hand, when you do not know, you need to explore, you need to try those different images, but at some point you need to be able to make a decision which image is the best. But how does it work? What is the algorithm behind it? So there are a few algorithms out there that allows to do this. I think the most famous one that some of you might already know is the Epsilon Greedy. However, as far as we are concerned, we decided to go to another one, which is called the Thompson sampling. So this is kind of the, the technical side for the, uh, for the data scientists out there. So the Thompson sampling, uh, long story short, is a Bayesian way of optimizing multi arm bandit problems. The way that you do this is you assign a beta distribution to each arm, each image, and then to choose an image, you sample a random score from each of those distributions and you take the maximum. So you can imagine if you do this process several times, you will get random images. When we observe a success or a failure from the environment and success and failure is a user just sees the image and doesn't interact with it or the user sees the image and choose to progress to the property, we then update this distribution, right? Obviously, because it's a Bayesian approach, we need a prior. In this case, we use an uninformative prior of uh, alpha one and beta one for the beta distributions. Now, more intuitively, if I were to show how it works, right? Here you have an example. Say that you have four images or four arms. Red is the worst, green is the best. You see that you, you have on the dotted lines on this animation, the true expected progression rates. And here you will see in a simulation how the, uh, this policy, Thompson sampling, is exploring different images. But as it starts observing which one works better, it starts focusing its, its traffic towards the more promising ones, right? So you see that, for instance, the red one will, uh, is sampled a little bit at the beginning, but it will be deactivated quite quickly. And you see that at, at the end of the simulation, most of the traffic is going toward the green and the red. So here you have a, um, a more kind of static visualization, right? From left to right, what, which arms were sa sampled, right? At the beginning, you see that even arm four is not really sampled very often due to noise, but you see that the bandit is exploring between arm one, arm two, arm three, which are the suboptimal ones. And as we start observing more and more information, the bandit progressively deactivate the worst of the arms, right? And you can see that toward the end of the iterations, the bandit now focusing on the best possible arm. So then the question is like, but how does it compare to A-B testing? And I think the slide kind of summarizes this quite well. A-B testing is, is a great tool, but it has one of the weaknesses of splitting the traffic uniformly between different options, right? So in this case, if we were to run on a specific property in A-B test, it will have to run for a certain period of time, usually predetermined, on equal traffic. But say, for instance, just for the sake of the argument, one of my images is a terrible one, like the toilet, that doesn't really attract anybody. Or for instance, it could be uh, like a container. So the bandit, what it can do compared to the, to the A-B testing is that it will deactivate those, this image quite quickly, right? And then we'll repurpose and refocus the traffic progressively toward more promising image, which make it converge so much more quickly. So uh, I think that's that's all for me. And I will pass on to uh, Judah to introduce, introduce how we scale this uh, in production. 
Thank you, Fedor. Uh, so, hey, everyone. My name is Jula, and I work at EPM Systems in Hungary. And I've been with Expedia for a long time, and most recently... Seem to have lost him for a second, don't we? Yes. Which is typical because the, the connection's been great the whole time and then uh, he, he drops off. So uh, we'll maybe just give him a minute just to uh, reconnect and go from there. S someone in his house has just turned on Netflix. That's what's happened. Fedor is now sweating, thinking, oh, am I going to have to cover the infrastructure as well? <laughs> that's, that's, that's not a problem. That's not a problem. I'd love to hear that. <laughs> you guys will be pleased to know I've already got four questions for you. <laughs> Not sure it's a good news or bad news. Uh, yeah, uh, that'll be good. <laughs> if anyone watching, don't forget the Q and A. Um, if I've got four questions, I'm so, sure you guys at home have as well. I think for purpose of time, I can take over the infrastructure part. Is that okay? Like if Julia will be able to jump in, I'm sure. She comes back. Okay. Love that. Professional oh. Fedor. That's what I love to see. <laughs> yeah, this, despite all the wine. <laughs> all right. I'll get out of the way. Cheers. All right. So, okay. Let me then cover you the infrastructure, right? Ah, it's, uh, no. Okay. It's still me. All right. So one of the main questions that we have, right, is how do we run this scale, right? We have, on, in Expedia, we have millions of properties, right? And millions of daily users. So the question is, how do we scale such an algorithm or such series of algorithms, right? As I said, you have a separate bandit for each property. How do you scale it uh, to uh, hundreds of thousands of hourly requests? Ah, Duda, you're back. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was yeah, like having a network glitch for a minute, okay. right. so sorry. So I'll let you start over then. Thank you. Uh, so I don't know when exactly it went south, but yeah. Uh, yeah, let me start with the introduction again. So, so my name is Jula and I work at EPEN Systems in Hungary uh, and I've been with Expedia for a long time. And most recently I've been focusing on working with Apache Flink and Kafka besides Java backend development. And today I'd like to talk about how image bandits work under the hood. Um, so multi-arm bandits are, are the simplest type of reinforcement learning technique. This type of machine learning algorithm require a more advanced platform as those models are not trained offline, but use real-time feedback to update their parameters. For this purpose, EPM systems in collaboration with Expedia Group have developed a cloud-based platform to run this at scale. Um, so in summary, such a platform will need to be able to serve a lot of requests with low latency, process the feedback messages based on user interactions and update the bandits. And we also need dashboards to be able to see what is going on with the bandits and with the platform itself. Next slide, please. So when the user is the page, the website application will request a configuration from our estimator API that will tell which image should be displayed. The estimator is part of our online inference platform, and the bandit algorithm is a model deployed on it. The estimator uses a cache to ensure consistent user experience within the lifetime of a session, and of course, this helps with performance too. But if there's no match in the cache, the estimator will execute the model. Now, the model needs the list of available candidate images, so we query our feature store, and from the results of that query, it will use Thomson sampling 
to decide which image to show. And then it returns this configuration to the website application where it's going to display the page and the image and the user can interact with it. Next slide, please. This interaction is the feedback that we need to use to update the model. So the website application will send these events to our tracking API, where after some bot filtering and validation, it is sent to an Apache Kafka topic and it's consumed by a Flink job, which is responsible for deduplicating, um, aggregating the messages for a session and producing the bandit parameter updates. These update messages are then sent to another Apache Kafka topic, which is consumed by a component of the feature store. And the update is written into the database and the next request will be served based on the updated parameters. Next slide, please. Apart from the feature store, there's another consumer of the update messages that we use for providing metrics, since it's aware of how the bandit is updated. This consumer is another Flink job and it produces metrics which then are collected by Prometheus and they are displayed on a Grafana dashboard. Next slide, please. This dashboard basically shows the stages of the feedback loop. On the top left, we display the Flink jobs input and output. Then in the middle, we show how the arms of a bandit are converging. This is based on the metrics we produce with the second Flink job. Then we can see some stats about updating the feature store. And on the bottom, we show the request latency of the estimator, and then the outgoing messages from the tracking API. So we kind of have the whole loop displayed on the dashboard. So it's easy to spot if any of the components is having issues. And we also have the metrics with the arms, which is quite helpful to see how it will change over time. Um, and back to you, Humayun. Cool, thanks, Julia. Um, Great, so now I will just go into a bit more detail of how we actually went about within Expedia <clears throat> to understand uh, the impact and how do you measure that impact to actual end users to actually show that is this bandit delivering value to our end customers and to the business. Um, so we had two phases of this approach of how to measure the impact. So phase one, what we call the testing uh, or learning phase of the bandits. Uh, and here, this is uh, where we gave the opportunity for the bandit to learn and try and find the best, pretty much the best image, basically how Fedor has said, can we start discounting the imageries that are not relevant to our customers based on the metric that we're optimizing for? And actually, can we actually start showing more appropriate imagery off the back of that? So what we did here was we had, uh, we, in the phase one, we had a split of traffic. We had 20% of traffic within the control, 80% traffic in the bandit algo. So the majority of the traffic was going for the bandit uh, to kind of let help, give enough traffic to get that learning um, and help the bandit learn. And we kept the 20% uh, control there just as a sanity check to make sure that if everything's okay and making sure that our ultimate metric, which is conversion and actual click-through rate is not being too harmed as a result of this bandit learning. So just to emphasize here, the bandit is learning based on the click-through rate. Uh, and we're trying to understand that a bit more in the kind of learning phase. And I think the next slide goes into a bit more detail of what we found out. So you can see here over the 28 day window um, on the bottom axis there, you see the top of days. And on the left there, you, on the left, you'll see the kind of click through rate. Um, you can see that the progression at the start uh, from day one to day seven, we actually saw a negative impact as a bandit was showing different types of images to our customers. So we, we actually did hypothesize this factor, but as a bandit started to learn and that kind of 80% of the traffic, you can see the bandit started to converge and started to show a better image to our customers. And you can see the primary metric that we're trying to actually measure for this one, the click-through rate, has started to progressively increase from day 15, day 16 onwards. So if you go to the next slide, then the phase two part of this was actually, well, what business impact will this have? So we've trained uh, the Bandit alg algorithm. We'll, we've given it a good a month or five weeks for it to learn. But how do we actually get a sanity check, say, what is the end result? So we paused the Bandit show the, to get the best imagery. We did a 50-50 A-B test uh, in the phase two uh, to kind of say, well, these are the imagery that has been selected as a result of the Bandit album. And this is the control, which is the kind of property selected here imagery. What impact are we going to see in our ultimate business metric uh, within Expedia, which is conversion? Are we seeing a good conversion impact? And by conversion, what we actually mean, because this is not always a useful concept, our customers are either buying more properties or selecting more properties. Uh, and other buying more properties as a result of showing this and then they're having an impact versus a control. And the next slide just goes into a bit more detail of what the results look like, right? 
So you can see here on the left, you can see the featured image selection. So these are the ones that property have selected. You can see the computer vision selected. So the ones that the aesthetic algorithm um, selected and you can see what the band is selected. So the band is selected with direct feedback and real-time feedback from our customers. You can see the imagery have changed as a result. And I think that's it for me, uh, unless there's one more slide on me, no. So I think ultimately what we're trying to show there is that we did see a conversion impact. We, it was one of the largest wins within Expedia at the time. Uh, and it was a great uh, business outcome as a result. So next steps is going back to that timeline that I've shown from a product perspective. Um, in 2021, the focus has been really now to say, say the question like, well, how can we add more relevancy factors within those algorithms? And how can we show more appropriate imagery for our customers? All our customers aren't the same. We have business travelers, we have family travelers, we have couple travelers. How can we contextualize our imagery even more to show more appropriate imagery for different types of customers, but also for different types of seasons and so on. So we are really looking to challenge this uh, question much more and see how we can add that more relevancy within our algorithms. And a big thing from a product perspective, this was one of our first multi-arm bandit uh, kind of use cases that we test from Expedia. What we're now doing is actually adopting this uh, same methodology across a number of different products across Expedia, from the different types of modules that you might see uh, within the search results page, the home page, to now even using that as a type of text that you might be seeing across different parts of the site. We're using multi-arm bandits to test various different types of versions of the site really quickly to get that feedback and see the impact of the business. Um, I think that's it from us. And really quickly, just want to say a few, lots of acknowledgements to a lot of people. This wasn't just me, Federal and Julia, that was working on this. There was a whole number of teams across Expedia Group and EPAM that have worked towards achieving this great outcome. And there's lots of slides uh, here. There's lots of links here. So at the bottom here, you'll see some links. Uh, so if you want to learn more about Expedia and EPAM, and there's also a blog post uh, that you can click on to learn much more detail uh, of the type of work that we're doing. And also Expedia Group's always hiring, so please do look at our career page, etc. cetera. Um, so you can definitely get that. So all the links are there as well. And that's it, thanks. Awesome, Th thank you very much. Uh, that was definitely very insightful, uh, very well put together and uh, definitely appreciate uh, it's not just the time giving the presentation, is it? It's the time planning and thinking through the slide deck and all that sort of stuff. So re really appreciate uh, the work there. Uh, it was interesting to see the credits. It's always nice to, to call that out. Um, I definitely want to give a big shout out to uh, Gabriel for kind of making this happen as well. So uh, thank you very much. I know he's watching in the background. Uh, and there were some uh, well-known names on that list, actually. So you've definitely got a crack, crack team of people. So I know a few of them. So uh, yeah, it's nice to be part of a team like that. So um, in terms of the Q, and a uh, we'll jump straight into that now actually uh, we've got quite a lot of questions to get through so we'll, we'll, we'll fire fire through them uh, it's always a good indication that it's been a good talk actually when there's lots of questions so uh, yeah we, we've, you've obviously done uh, done a good job and um, the only thing I would shout out um, actually to, to everyone at home uh, if you have enjoyed it please do put a little thank you in the chat uh, it's always nice for the speakers uh, when we're virtual uh, to know that there's been some people out there uh, in the world watching so uh, yeah great um, if we go to the Q&A now, uh, as I mentioned at the start, you can read along in the background just as I'm going through them. So we'll just take that first question there uh, from uh, Lampros. Uh, great presentation. Um, I would be very interested to hear about how you selected Thompson's sam sampling uh, over other uh, multi-arm bandit methods. I think this question is for me. So um, one of the reasons that we prefer um, this method is like, for instance, if we take, I think each algorithm has their own merits, right? So let's take Epsilon Greedy. So I, I assume that the so whoever asked the question actually knows about these algorithms. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the problems with Epsilon Greedy is that it actually always explore at a static rate. So if, for instance, one of the images is actually a very, very bad idea, we would like to be able to deactivate it very quickly, something that the Thompson sampling will be doing. Compared to the upper confidence bound, which is the other very popular type of algorithms, the way that our infrastructure is set up, we don't want to have a situation in which if the feedback loop stops for whatever failure, we end up showing always the same image, right? On the one hand, Thompson sampling is always randomized. So you hit it 10,000 times, you will have different images unless it has converged to one. 
However, the UCB is not randomized. It will be always the same image up until you update the algorithm. So we didn't really like this feature. We thought it was not um, very robust for our use case. So this is why we chose uh, Thompson sampling. Like there's also the adversarial bandits, but these ones actually take very long to converge. So we abandoned that idea for now. Perfect. Thank you very much, Fedor. Um, again, going through the questions, uh, I tend to be conscious of time and just fire, fire through them. So uh, whoever's best to answer them, uh, ju just shout out. Um, I suspect the audience are leaning a little bit towards you, you Fedor. So we'll, we'll, see, we'll see what happens and then, and then we'll go from there. Um, next question there is from uh, Harpool. Um, how did you determine the starting values for your beta distributions uh, in each arm? So uh, starting distributions, as I said, we put a prior of on, on the beta distribution of alpha one, beta one, and it becomes an uninformative uh, prior, which kind of doesn't have any opinion and can converge progressively. It's just an initialization, in the initialization value. There is some ideas that we haven't explored where you could potentially put an informative prior that could make the bandit faster, but we haven't really observed, like explored that idea yet. Thank you very much, Fedor. Uh, just as we're doing that in the chat, uh, Abhishek uh, saying, great presentation. Uh, can we please share the slides? Uh, they've been recorded. Uh, there was a number of links there actually. So maybe there's a slide deck in the links, but this has also been recorded uh, and will be released. So that, that's cool. Uh, Joanna Kitchen, uh, Kitson uh, as well. Uh, thank you, uh, that, that was awesome. So yeah, th thank you very much for uh, jumping on the chat. Um, getting back to the questions, the next one there from uh, Lorna. Um, have you thought about using contextual bandits uh, instead of multi-arm bandits? Um, yes, so this is definitely like uh, an evolution that we want to start exploring, right? Um, so we started with multi-arm bandits because you want to start to learn to walk before you start running, right? Uh, however, contextual multi-arm bandits is a, is a very interesting candidate, right? So we could, in theory, run a contextual bandit per property where we could start capturing relevant contexts. And one of the most relevant contexts uh, we have in travel, in the travel industry, is whether people are traveling with their family or as a couple or as a single individual, right? We can observe in this type of uh, customers very different uh, preferences. So yes, this is definitely an idea we, we are exploring in the future. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, imagine that's a can of worms once you start to look into it, because, uh, yeah, sometimes I travel for business, sometimes with family and exactly as you say, you, you look for different things. So uh, perfect. Uh, next question there from uh, Saif. Um, what metrics uh, do you use to determine, determine if a person uh, likes the image? So the metrics we, we use, uh, as I said, is on, on the search page. Mm -hmm. uh, the denominator would be the number of users exposed to this image and the numerator would be the number of people who interacted with the image or the property in general. So that's, that's the one. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, I'm actually at this point uh, going to bring, uh, we'll come back to the questions. I've, I've just got a couple of mine actually uh, and bring in the, the, the others uh, that were presenting as well. Um, and I think what, one of the things that's very clear in this that is, uh, as quite often is the case with data projects, it, it feels like a definite team effort, uh, which obviously you called out with the credits there, there at the end. Uh, obviously the, the, the background in these people, you know, they're, they're from you know, very different functional teams, a uh, lot of diversity there and things like that. Uh, how did you find that? Uh, at Expedia and EPAM, uh, and have you got any tips uh, to, to function uh, with your colleagues and, and deliver good products? Um, yeah, I think what we did here is that we were working together as a, as a team um, with data scientists and engineers together, and of course the product people. Um, and that way of working uh, was, yeah, working really well for us. and. Uh, and since since then we have continued working in this this way. Yep. Perfect, perfect. And yeah, how it, was it from from the product side of things? Yeah, I think uh, uh, to be honest, at the first it was, it was quite a big change, a quite a big uh, kind of shift from going from a traditional A/B test framework to actually saying we can actually test a number of different variants at scale uh, mm -hmm. within Expedia. So I think it was a quite a big learning curve within product to really understand it. But I think ultimately what I echo what Dudia has said there, which was how can we find ways to really, really work closely with data science and engineering to really understand the insides of like, well, how are we learning from that um, algorithm? 
what well, can we influence the metrics we're trying to do and then really add that customer lens in the work that we're actually doing because like federal said the the learning metric of click-through rate yes that's a, a great metric but actually should be informed from what our customers are actually doing so adding that product and customer lens is really important in a lot of these bandits and i think it's quite important to have product and also content teams and our researchers have been involved throughout the process so i think that's something that we've learned with Expedia. Perfect. Yeah, well, well done. Well done. Uh, and that actually leads into the question. It's actually the, the, the very bottom of the Q&A, but it's a similar sort of theme to this from, from Harpool. Uh, Harpool saying, hey, great talk. Um, how did you convince uh, the business in the value uh, of performing such a test? Uh, and more specifically, how did you show that this should be a higher priority uh, over other, other priorities? So uh, I guess that, that question specifically, but also a wider uh, conversation you know how, how how does it work in terms of prioritizing you know workloads and projects uh, and things like that with you guys do you want to go federal or do you want me to go if, please go for mine yeah yeah i think ultimately um the reason why we wanted to prioritize in the business because we, like i said at the beginning we know how important imagery is to our customers um we con constantly see in our research how important imagery is in terms of top three decision makers so in terms of uh, getting this prioritized, it naturally fit, fit one of our kind of customer problems that we're looking to really solve. And actually working with data science and data science doing those investigations and showing to product and the business, like these are the real benefits that we can deliver if we start showing more relevant imagery to our customers. Um, and that's how we naturally got prioritized within it. And by doing this kind of first kind of test and showing those key metrics of how we delivered quite a great con conversion uplift, it kind of really evangelized this product and way of working to the wider business, like using a multi iron and bandit technique, one of the biggest wins that we've had within the business and start scaling to other use cases means the pace of doing product iterations is far quicker than your traditional AV test ways yeah. of doing it. So I think there's a huge business value um, and starting like evangelizing that within product and the business is quite important. Perfect. Perfect. And I guess just wider context, obviously, you mentioned that uh, you, you're hiring there, uh, which, which is, you know, great. So it's good to, to highlight that. And um, are you able to give us any more, you know, context on other data challenges that you're working on? I've got absolutely stacks of questions to get back to in terms of multi arm bandits. Uh, but before we uh, get back to Fedor with that, yeah, is there, can you tell us a bit more about, you know, the type of data challenges that you're working on? I think ultimately it's more around how can we add that level of relevancy and personalization for our customers? Um, and we can solve that in different ways uh, with Expedia. At Expedia, we're one, we're one of the biggest travel platforms out there uh, and we've got a huge amount of travel data uh, around our customers. And what we want to do uh, within Expedia and what we are doing is like, how can we utilize that data and add that level of relevancy and personalization? Uh, I don't think I'm going to details all the types of features that we're doing, but mm -hmm. we are definitely accelerating our efforts of using machine learning techniques to show a much more relevant, personalized, and contextual journey for our customers. Uh, and that's what we ultimately want to drive for. Um, but I don't know, Fedor, if you had anything from a data science perspective. No, um, I'm, I'm actually not sure. Is the question about like our project or just more general within the company? I think a bit of both, actually. It's, it's always nice to you know, get an insight into an organization. Uh, yeah. And I think people at home will be interested to learn a bit more, particularly if they're interested in perhaps applying and things like that, just to get a bit of wider yeah. context. I think I think one of the things that like I observe changing uh, with not within only within Expedia but within the industry among my friends is that like uh, the quality of the infrastructure to deploy machine learning algorithms has improved drastically, and in a way it has become the El Dorado of machine learning. All the web commerces today had so many opportunities when it comes to optimizing images, right? So on one hand we used the reinforcement learning, but we've done a tremendous amount of effort on improving the computer vision algorithm. Do you have also destination images, right? Which is a different type of problem with the same type of algorithms. In different domains, like everything which is text related, right? Reviews, mm -hmm. uh, tags, so on and so forth. This is the type of problems that we need to solve as well to show more relevant content to our customer. What, what is the review which is relevant to us? You also have like the classic recommendation problems that everybody is, I think, familiar with, where which property I should be recommending to customers that have clicked on a certain series of properties and so on and so forth, right? So like the, there's a tremendous amount of challenges. And today, I think we live in a very interesting period of time where we can actually start putting everything in production quite efficiently without having to kind of spend like six months building something because now it's there. Yeah. And now it's about iterating and kind of implementing yeah, yeah. ideas. Amazing. Yeah, getting some 
data science out the door and into production. So uh, yeah, happy day. Sounds good, sounds good. And uh, we will get back to the, the Q&A actually, uh, if that's okay. Uh, I'll take the question there that's from George. Um, George is asking, uh, how is the image being served in the control group? Uh, randomly se select an image for the property or you know, how do you approach uh, serving an image in the control group? So uh, I'll take this one from one if you find yeah. So if we're talking about the control group, we're talking about the EP test, right? So what we what we want to, what it, the way that we want to do it at first is when we run the first iteration, right? We already had a control in there. So what we wanted to do is to prove that we are actually improving the website. So in the control group, we were just using the images that were selected from a legacy perspective. Yeah. If the image, if the property owner has changed the image in the middle of the test, we will still take whatever the change was. Mm -hmm. I think that answers the question. Yeah, it does. Yeah, and uh, I think it's the same in a lot of businesses, isn't it? You think you know the business, you think you know what's best for your hotel, and uh, it turns out if you use the data, you get a different answer. So, uh, <laughs> so we, it's, this is not exactly our, our position, right? So, I we like if we take the the images as selected by our partners. They are of high quality, 99.9% .9 of the time. It's just sometimes it's about also what the customers are interested by. And sometimes you might play safe by choosing, for instance, like a very beautiful facade, but actually you have a very quirky feature. Like we've seen in Las Vegas, for instance, they have absolutely crazy features in their in their hotels, like mm -hmm. shark tanks in the middle of the in the middle of the hotel. And those images are very interesting. They can intrigue a customer, saying, "Okay, that's that's your differentiator, right?" Yeah. And they cannot capture this with the data that they have, but we can, and we can help them market their property better. Perfect. Yeah, it makes sense. Makes sense. Sounds good. Um, next question there from Mateus. Um, uh, good to see you online. Uh, I've not seen you for a while. Um, uh, hi, folks. Uh, how did you balance the traffic volume uh, and marketing stats, uh, conversion rate, etc., for, for the training? So if I understand, the, oh, by the way, hi, Matt, hope you're doing well. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, if I understand the question right, so it's true that the optimization of the algorithm was focused on the only single metric, which is progression rate from the search page to the property page. But now the question is, yeah, how do you take into account what you're doing with the rest? And here is, uh, it's based on some, some assumptions we made, right? We just assumed that the progression from the search page to property page is a good proxy of user interest, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, if you think about it, it comes also with a series of problems. Say for instance, like an image is very funny. It's not necessarily very useful, but it's very funny. A user might click on it and progress, but might not book, right? So yeah. it, is a, it is a proxy. We were actually quite afraid of this clickbait effect happening. We didn't observe it, but we need to be conscious that the metric that you choose might not be necessarily the best all the time, but it has to be a proxy, which is good enough. Yeah. So this is why we did the second phase A-B test to kind of confirm that the way that we optimized actually impacts the other business metrics uh, and KPIs that we want to optimize for the business. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll keep going through these questions then. Uh, question from Lampros uh, again. Um, do you have any other details about frameworks uh, for multi-arm bandits used uh, in-house or commercial packages? So uh, we build everything uh, in house, but I'm saying build, but a Thompson sampling is like 10 lines of Python code. Mm -hmm. So obviously um, Dula has present you like, it's a multi arm bandit is not about the machine learning algorithm. It's about a very powerful architecture to kind of drive this, especially this feedback loop that we, allows us to ingest millions of messages and update them, right? So mm -hmm. I think the power of this project is more in the infrastructure than the algorithm itself. Perfect, thank you very much. Um, next question there is from from Joe. Um, so if we if we go through this one together, actually, just to make sure uh, I'm doing it justice, um, could you comment on if the multi arm bandit test does not show better results? Uh, does the multi arm bandit make it hard to diagnose since we deactivate less favourable samples uh, very quickly? So obviously you're having great success. I guess this is more a question of what happens if things start to go wrong. Uh, you know. Yeah. So uh, this is where at this specific time, you know, like obviously 
reinforcement learning and multi arm bandits are based on certain assumptions that you make about the data generating process. So, for instance, you kind of assume that the reward rate that you observe is static over time. You know, there's a lot of things that kind of you cannot really control in the real world, right? Mm -hmm. it, as soon as you go beyond the simulation, things get messy. So there is always like a, a side of leap of faith in there saying that the algorithm is going to eventually converge to the best, and maybe if not the best, the second best possible image, right? And this is why we kind of use both A-B test on business metrics and the multi unbended to see whether in general, we are doing better for the company. Now, obviously from a diagnostic perspective, uh, Joe is totally right. Uh, you cannot use multi arm bandits and look at those rates and do a hypothesis test on them because it will be completely biased. You cannot really say how bad an image was, right? Uh, from This is why we need to use kind of alternative ways of, of assessing the bandits. So for instance, feedback from our partners, whether they're happy with the result, whether they want us to kind of eliminate one of the results. They have this possibility also to tell like, uh -huh. I don't want this image to be shown. Can you please not show it, right? But it's true that like there is a lot of research to do kind of into trying to understand when a bandit goes wrong and how to yeah, how to diagnose it. Yeah. This is a very relevant question. I hope the answer is somewhat satisfactory, but yeah, this is still kind of perfect. Th ahead. Thank you very much. Sounds like another topic in itself. We'll we'll have to get you all to come back uh, later in the year and uh, dig, dig deeper. Um next question there from uh, Eugenio. Um how how was the 2080 split? Uh, between the control bandit chosen, uh, isn't it risky to start with an 80% on the bandit given that you start with a negative uplift? You guys were backing yourself, uh, is the answer. Or... That is, that's a really good question. I think that's one of the product risks that we had uh, with any bandit, right? Um, I think the reason why we actually had that 20% uh, was actually as a benchmark to see if there's any significant conversion uh, impact as a result of that bandit. So that was our kind of sanity check. Uh, we have dashboards in place to know um, what is the impact ultimate conversion. Um, so we use that as a sanity check and we do do plumbing tests. So we gradually increase traffic to make sure that the infrastructure was in place, but also to make sure there's no significant conversion impact on the back of it. And we had acceptable limits. Uh, we knew this was a learning phase. Um, so we accepted that there will be some impact for the four weeks, but we did see those improvements. Um, so yeah, ultimately we kept that 20% as a fallback uh, to monitor it. Uh, and we continue, continue to monitor it every, really closely every couple of days to make sure there's no big conversion impact. Mm. Perfect. I, I, I like it. I like the approach. You've got to back yourself in these things, haven't you? So um, one final question. Uh, so yeah, as I say, if, if you are there at home, please do ping a little thank you in the chat. Um, the last question here from Jao, just before we draw things to, to a close. Um, hopefully I'm doing this justice, Jao, um, but again, uh, Fed or, uh, or one of the other guys, uh, help me out if you can. Um, is there an element in the algorithm that can help you to quickly capture the non-stationarity uh, in the environment? Uh, as I assume that the people's taste of the images could change across time. This is a fantastic question. Uh, I think I can spend like an hour talking about this, but let me give you the quick rundown. Like yep. three ways that we are exploring and or you can explore to, to tackle this problem. The first one is kind of a non-answer in a sense that if you run bandits as campaigns, as we did, so we run a bandit, we converge, we test, we choose the best one, and then we run a new campaign. If you run campaigns quite regularly, then if taste change, if the season change, for instance, between winter, season, the winter and the summer, we might not want to be showing the same images, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we will be able somewhat to capture some of this trend, right? This is a non-answer, but this is something that can already happen. But then mm -hmm. like more algorithmically, right? There is, I would say, Two, two ways to do that. Like you can actually apply a modification on the Thompson sampling in which you can discount the parameters that I mentioned before, right? You have the alpha and beta, you can actually multiply them by a discount factor regularly, which makes the bandit forget what it has learned with time and start yeah. exploring again. So if there's a change in taste, taste, it will be eventually captured by the bandit. And the third way of doing this, I would say, is to use uh, what I mentioned before, the adversarial bandits, because those adversarial bandits are designed for that type of situation. Your environment is completely non-stationary and you're trying to do the best you can uh, and evolve. But those type of algorithms tend to kind of always explore much more and being a bit slower to converge because they are much more careful. Perfect, perfect. Uh, well, uh, that brings us uh, towards a close actually. So uh, we've absolutely, 
flown through 13 questions uh, following what was a very, very interesting talk. So uh, once again, uh, I would like to just thank uh, all of you uh, for, for giving up your time uh, to come and present at the Data Science Festival. Uh, I hope you've uh, enjoyed it. Uh, we will absolutely uh, be keeping in touch. Uh, I think what you've been doing there is super interesting. Uh, and obviously we have our main uh, data science festival in November uh, with a whole month of events and stuff like that, including hopefully some live events as well. So uh, we'll keep in touch uh, and perhaps we can get you back uh, a bit later in the year. But um, just to draw things to a close uh, super quickly, uh, thank you all for joining us at home. Uh, we have put some content in the chat uh, in relation to our summer school. Uh, so if that's of interest, uh, please do check that out. But um, yeah, uh, once again, thank you very much, EPAM. Uh, thank you very much, Expedia. Uh, and thank all of you for giving up your time to share with the community. Uh, and we'll see you all soon. So uh, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye.